Thank you very much. I'm uh, so honored to uh, be joining the 37th meeting of the PSDE, and uh, I'm joining uh, this morning from the United Nations, uh, where there will be a session of the UN Security Council on Peace and Development, so very appropriate. I'm glad that the Security Council is recognizing the inextricable linkage of sustainable development and sustainable peace, because when we don't have sustainable development, we have unrest, instability, even war. And today, the Security Council will be examining that linkage, and I'll be testifying at the Security Council in just a, a few minutes. But it's very uh, wonderful opportunity for me to start the day with you. Uh, so that we can brainstorm together about Pakistan's situation. Of course, the economic situation for Pakistan is not good, uh, not good at all. Uh, this is a year of significant crisis, uh, and the uh, aggregate uh, economy is projected to decline in absolute amount, which means rising poverty levels and rising distress in Pakistan. And even the projections for future growth are quite modest. Uh, the difficulties in Pakistan are deep and serious. And I believe that you've asked me to speak because Pakistan needs uh, a, a fundamental uh, development strategy that is not contained, for example, in the recent IMF agreement, which is little more than an austerity program, fiscal cuts, uh, and uh, no real development uh, strategy built into that program. So this uh, is why I think it's so important for us to, to meet and to strategize. And let me say right at the outset that I can only uh, skim the surface of uh, the realities, and of course you know them vastly better than I do, but I would be very interested in continuing a collaboration to brainstorm on the best ways forward. I don't think that in crises like these, uh, government is typically able to be creative. At best, it is uh, able to manage but it is uh, scholars and universities uh, and uh, thinkers who have the chance to look forward and to present uh, more uh, profound analyses that can help uh, governments to reorient. And I would also say that the international institutions that Pakistan must deal with now, such as the IMF and the World Bank, are also not very creative these days. I'm pressing for much more creativity than we have so that we move beyond austerity programs and really enable the kind of economic breakthroughs that are possible with the right kind of strategy. When I look at Pakistan's uh, situation and I review the basic macroeconomic conditions, that is the broad aggregates of the Pakistan economy, what strikes me immediately are two facts. One, Pakistan's investment rate, measured as domestic investment as a share of GDP, is around 13%, uh, terribly low. Pakistan, as a country with uh, a per capita income of between one and two thousand U.S. dollars should have an investment rate of 30 to 40 percent of GDP so that Pakistan can make the core investments in human capital, in infrastructure, and in business development that would enable Pakistan to achieve rapid and sustained economic growth. So the first thing that I see is a very, very low investment rate. The second number that is very concerning to me is the school life expectancy. 
school life expectancy is a statistical calculation of the expected years of schooling of a representative child, taking into account the net enrollment rates at all levels of schooling. And in Pakistan, the expected years of schooling is just eight years. And that's the same basically for boys and girls. So while there is a, a gender gap with boys having roughly one year higher expected years of schooling, it's very, very low for both boys and girls. And I would say that in addition to the investments in physical capital, which I referred to earlier, the investments in human capital, and especially in schooling and skills, is certainly the most fundamentally important investment for economic development. I would say that it's the overwhelming factor because when skills are high, then the opportunity to start businesses and raise capital is also high and investment rates rise as a result of the higher skills in the population. So Pakistan is facing a situation of very uh, uh, bleak prospects under the current economic strategy. Low levels of investment in skills and low levels of investment in physical and business capital. And the question is what to do about this. And here there is one more number that I would point to macroeconomically, and that is the government revenues measured as a share of the gross domestic product. And Pakistan's government revenues are on the order also of about 12% of GDP. This is extraordinarily low. This means that the Pakistan government cannot afford to make the investments in schooling and the investments in infrastructure that are necessary for a breakthrough to economic growth and sustainable development. So there's a kind of trap. The trap is very low levels of government revenue, very low levels of public investment, low levels of school completion, weak infrastructure, chronically low growth. And this is what we observe in Pakistan, a kind of low level macroeconomic trap. Nothing in the IMF program will overcome that trap. Quite the contrary. The main message of the International Monetary Fund program is further budget austerity, further cuts to public spending, further cuts to public infrastructure, further cuts to social outlays, further cuts to schooling. And so the result of this austerity program might be to reduce the budget deficit perhaps, it might uh, help to stabilize the high rate of inflation, which itself is a reflection of the chronic fiscal instability, but it will do nothing to create the conditions for rapid and sustainable economic growth. Now we can add a couple more factors to this picture. One, of course, is the environmental catastrophe that Pakistan suffered and the very high vulnerability to ongoing human-induced climate change. And, of course, the terrible floods that Pakistan suffered were no fault of Pakistan. They were the result of global climate change that has intensified the flooding in the upper Himalayan region. Of course, that flooding is to some extent exacerbated by deforestation in the higher Himalayas and uh, 
other infrastructure, but basically this was a visitation on Pakistan by forces beyond Pakistan's control. And the international community, of course, as always, failed to respond adequately. Pakistan's losses were estimated to be between 30 and 50 billion dollars. The donor assistance pledges were a few billion dollars, hardly enough to enable Pakistan to face this terrible calamity. And there's no doubt that the 2022 floods played directly into the 2023 fiscal crisis. So Pakistan is suffering an aggravation of the natural disaster in the form of the fiscal disaster. So none of this uh, has an easy solution, but all of it points to the need for a long-term development strategy that is based on higher rates of public and private investment and an investment program that is broad-based to raise the level and quality of schooling, to improve the physical infrastructure, roads, power, rail, digital access, water and sanitation, and climate resiliency, all of which are public investments that require significant increases in outlays. Now, how can this be brought about? I think that there are two elements to uh, bring this about. And both of those elements re require a economic strategy and a quantification of that economic strategy over the period of the next 20 years. In other words, Pakistan needs long-term planning in order to be able to carry out the right kind of investment strategy. The first part of the investment strategy should be long-term fiscal management, especially raising government revenues as a share of the gross national product so that Pakistan has the ability to increase public outlays on education, health care, and public infrastructure. It's simply not possible for Pakistan to achieve development unless over the next 10 to 20 years, government revenues rise from the current rates of 12 or 13 percent of GDP to at least 25 to 30 percent of GDP because it's only that higher level of public outlays that will enable the kinds of investments that are needed. The second point is that during this period of fiscal strengthening, Pakistan also needs to raise the investment rate, not to wait because Pakistan urgently needs investments now in schooling, in health care, in uh, physical infrastructure. And here, I believe, uh, a strategy needs to be devised based not on aid, but on long-term financing of Pakistan at low interest rates and long maturities of finance so that Pakistan takes more debt but in a way that does not lead to a crisis in the next two years or five years or ten years but gives Pakistan the space for 30 to 40 years to build the human capital and infrastructure for rapid economic growth. Consider this. Starting in Pakistan's condition with investment rates of 30 to 40 percent of GDP, Pakistan could achieve economic growth reliably of at least 7 percent per year. Even higher with the right kinds of investments. Now, growing at 7 percent per year means that the economy doubles every decade. And if that is done over a 30-year period, the economy is eight times larger than today. 
if the growth is at 10% per year, of course, the economy doubles every seven years. So in a period of just 35 years, Pakistan's economy would grow five times. Uh, I'm sorry, would double five times or would grow 35 times. The point is that Pakistan could achieve and needs to plan for rapid economic growth based on high levels of investment and then to recognize that with that rapid growth, even more debt taken on today will be completely manageable, not in five or 10 years, but in 30 to 40 years. So the strategy that I am recommending is strengthening the budget in order to be able to carry out more public investments and strengthening the long-term borrowing of Pakistan, yes, even more debt, but at maturities of 30 to 40 years so that the financing can be used effectively for long-term development to achieve rapid economic growth. I've been looking at this kind of scenario for several low-income countries recently, and it does check out the idea of more external finance to jumpstart rapid and sustained growth. Of course, the IMF and even traditional uh, observers object to this kind of approach because they say it will just lead to another debt crisis. But I think that this is mistaken. The reason for debt crisis is that the debt is short term. It does not give the space, the time, to enable the long-term growth to take place. But with long-term financing, there is much more flexibility available for Pakistan to achieve a 10 to even 30 time increase of output over the next 30 to 40 years, so that what looks like a large level of debt today would actually be very manageable. Now, two points that I would emphasize in this regard. The first is that Pakistan's external debt as a share of the gross domestic product is not very large right now. According to the International Monetary Fund, it's about 35% of GDP. Pakistan is not over indebted. The problem is that the debt is short term. It's falling due. Pakistan is illiquid, not insolvent. So this is the first point. The debt is not very large. The second point that I would emphasize is that the returns to borrowing in terms of increased economic output are enormous. If one looks at the benefits, for example, of investing in a young child in Pakistan today to enable that girl or boy to finish not just lower school or lower secondary school, but to finish upper secondary school and some tertiary education, a reasonable estimate of the returns to that investment is that it is around 20% per annum rate of return investing in a child's education and skills. There are few investments in the world that have a higher return than investing in a child to achieve a success in education. And so it is worth it for Pakistan to borrow today on a long-term basis in order to invest in its children and build the infrastructure for long-term success. Now this raises the question, who is going to lend Pakistan such funding? And here I would like to propose three answers. First, there are good development partners in the world, and one of them I believe is China. The Belt and Road Initiative can help Pakistan to build long-term investment, but China also needs to ensure that the financing under the Belt and Road Initiative is of the kind that I'm urging, which is 30 to 40 year maturities at low interest rates. So this is one kind of financing that I think is extremely important. 
and a strong link of China and Pakistan through the Belt and Road Initiative can be a vehicle for significantly raising Pakistan's investments in infrastructure in particular. A second kind of financing that can be expanded tremendously is long-term financing from international finance institutions, notably the multilateral development banks. Pakistan is a member, for example, of course, of the Asian Development Bank and is a member of the Islamic Development Bank. And both of them should increase the flow of financing to Pakistan. In other words, uh, the critical financing, for example, for education and health care, backed by long-term lending or Islamic finance in the case of the Islamic Development Bank. At the United Nations, my day job is to help uh, promote a larger lending portfolio by uh, the multilateral development banks. And remember that in addition to the Asian Development Bank and the Islamic Development Bank, there are several new development banks that Pakistan could also tap, such as the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank based in Beijing and the new development bank of the BRICS countries based in Shanghai. So this is two more areas of lending. The third area of financing that I would advocate is, uh, of course, Pakistan's voice among the uh, emerging economies for a vast increase of financing for climate resilience, losses and damages, and energy transformation. We are on our way to COP28 in just uh, uh, 10 days from now. Uh, this uh, COP28 will take place in Dubai. Pakistan certainly has a lot of friends and supporters uh, in the United Arab Emirates uh, and in the Gulf region. This is the time to make Pakistan's voice heard, that Pakistan's uh, experience with the floods uh, is uh, the absolute powerful and devastating evidence of the need for far greater international financing for losses and damages, for climate adaptation, and for energy sector transformation. So this is a third area where Pakistan's financing, in my opinion, can be bolstered. All of this is to say, ladies and gentlemen, that Pakistan needs an investment-led growth model, and it needs Pakistan's economists to help chart out the path for that high investment, rapid growth development strategy. Such a long-term plan can demonstrate how a combination of fiscal transformation and responsible long-term financing can enable Pakistan to raise the investment rates significantly to 30 to 40 percent of GDP. Following that will come higher domestic saving rates and better budget revenues. And all of this will mean a turn from the current trap of low growth and environmental crisis to the potential for rapid economic growth and sustainable development. Well, these are just a, a few general thoughts. Uh, I would be most grateful to work together with uh, the uh, PSDE uh, and with the economists to help think through what such a high growth scenario could look like. It would be the basis for a renewed strategy that could take Pakistan out of its uh, current crisis and put Pakistan on the path that we know is absolutely feasible of rapid economic development and rapid improvements uh, in the education and skills of Pakistan's young people who will be, of course, the future of your wonderful country.
Thank you for enabling me just to share a few thoughts with you today. Congratulations on the 37th edition of the TSDE uh, conference, uh, and I look forward to collaboration with you in the future. Thank you so much.